Uh, I'm David Remnick from The New Yorker, and uh, the title we've chosen to give to this evening is You Say You Want a Revolution, which tells me an old person gave a title to this, not a, not a younger one. But I think you know what the evening is about. It is about the movement that started downtown and has spread to how many? Hundreds of over 300 1400. cities. Somewhere between yeah. 300 and 1400. <laughs> We're going to get an accurate count sooner than later. They ask us how many people have showed up. We're like between 100 and 100 million. Okay. So. <laughs> Which will be something we'll discuss too. So um, this program that we've been running now this year and, 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 and occurs on a, a monthly basis is called The Big Story. And um, I, a couple of house uh, rules. Please um, silence your phone. You want to tweet, tweet your head off, but let's not hear any phone ringing. We're going to have a conversation that will last about 50 minutes. Is that all right? That's OK? And then, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for questions. And those questions, I beg of you, implore you, are going to be questions, and not, not statements or speeches, which is, which is perfectly legitimate in another forum, or even going like that, <laughs> um, that there'll be real questions. Um, and I want to introduce the panel. There, there you go. That sounded like a phone being turned off. <laughs> to my right is Priscilla Grimm, who's the co-editor and project manager for the newspaper Occupied Wall Street Journal. The Occupied Wall Street Journal, and I can brandish that in a second. Uh, and is the co-author of the very important Tumblr blog, um, We Are the 99%, which has been uh, responsible for a lot of the communications and, and uh, getting people to go to Zuccotti Park. She has worked in her, her life as a, she's a single mother. She's worked as a fundraiser and a promoter for nonprofit organizations and is currently cutting class tonight from Columbia University where she's a, a part-time master's student. Only because you said you'd write me a letter. I did. I said I'd write an email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the way we do it here. <laughs> um, John Cassidy, who I think you all know, He's a wonderful writer for The New Yorker. Lately, he's been writing online every single day, and in fact, not least about the, um, uh, the subject of tonight's discussion. He's covered economics at the magazine for as long as I've been at the magazine, for quite a while. Oh, never mind. Too long. <laughs> <laughs> the blog for the moment is called Rational Irrationality, and we'll talk about that. His latest book is How Markets Fail. John is nothing if not prescient. The Logic of Economic Calamities, and that was published in 2009. To my left is Arun Gupta, who's a founding editor of the, a founding editor of the newspaper, The Independent. Independent with a Y. I go for the cheap applause. <laughs> He's written about the Occupy Wall Street movement for Salon and the Occupy Wall Street Journal, and has been traveling to various Occupy protests around the country and he is working on a book on the decline of the American empire, a very small topic that he's going to fit into. <laughs> <laughs> um, my colleague, Jill Lepore, is a New Yorker staff writer and, um, incidentally, a professor of American history at uh, Harvard University. Her books include New York Burning, a Pulitzer Prize finalist, and The Whites of Their Eyes, The Tea Party's Revolution and the battle over American history. Her next book, The Mansion of Happiness, A History of Life and Death, another short topic, <laughs> is coming out next year. And finally, former governor of New York, the former New York <clears throat> State Attorney General, and classmate of mine, I should say, <clears throat> Elliot Spitzer. Elliot also hosted the CNN show In the Arena and writes a column for Slate on the economy. We are going to try to move this along with some alacrity, but I first want to go to my discussions to my right and my left, no political uh, or ideological um, meaning there. Let's start with you, okay? Priscilla, you have done a tremendous amount of work, but I, I, I think that there's no doubt that a lot of people have a hard time grasping what the meaning of all this is, that people try to fit it into a box, oh, it's just like the Tea Party, but on the left. Oh, it's just like the anti-war movement, but, but, but. I'd like you to do a little bit of self-defining what we're witnessing, what it is, what it is not, and what it's meant to you. Well, one of the things that I want to make very clear before I say anything, I do not speak for the movement. There is not one leader in the movement. Fair enough. There are common ideas that thread us all together. Um, 
I, when I think about Occupy Wall Street and my involvement in it, I see myself as part of an essential fight for economic civil rights in this country. Um, Trickle-down economics, the system as it stands right now, does not work for the rest of us. And it's painfully obvious by looking at the American birth rates that have been declining, looking at our life expectancy that's been declining, looking at people in the middle of the country who have to choose between food and gas money to go to work that day. It's not a system that's sustainable for us. And that's why the minute I saw, I, I first heard about Occupy Wall Street on Facebook and it seemed like such a remarkable idea. And um, an occupation, this not a protest, an in occupation. In, in July, I first heard about it in September after uh, the after there's this band called Manu Chao mm -hmm. who performed here, and they had someone come on stage and talk about Occupy Wall Street and the call to action that was issued by Adbusters in July. Um, the New York General Assembly had been working very hard to bring all the pieces together in order to make this explain, happen. Explain what that is for people to. Uh, the New York General Assembly. It's a collection of individuals. I myself was able to show up to one of their last meetings before the occupation started on September 17th. Um, and basically, if you showed up and you're ready to work and ready to engage with other people in a democratic way, it's, um, it's participation. It's working with the community together. Um, you know, there's not a hierarchy. This is a movement with no leaders. We are all becoming leaders. Why is that important? It's important because in, you know, historically in other movements, you know, you have a leader, you take them out, the movement can die. This way, it lives inside of all of us. And that's what's most important because that's what's going to drive our passion that's needed to make the full commitment to see this through to systemic change in this country. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, Arun, same questions, just to, just to get us started. Um, both your, your personal beginnings with this and what you would identify as, as without saying that it's uh, everybody's agenda, what your agenda is, what, what or the motivating force behind your activity here? I'm, I'm coming as someone who is uh, certainly a supporter, but also as a journalist. I've been there since uh, day one. The independent cover social movement, so we kn knew that this was going to happen. And I think one of the most important things that's been overlooked is the occupation itself is the demand that uh, people in this country are taught, uh, are told in every way and they've internalized that their social being is about consumption. You know, we go to movies, we go to restaurants, we shop, uh, we engage the world through the internet, television. And what Zuccotti Park did was it showed the possibility and, and I think even the beauty of a non-commodified popular democratic space. And the fact that you've had um, for something like 1,400 occupations now break out around the country shows that there is a process of social reproduction. That okay, Arun, we're coming, I, in my mind, we're coming a little close to jargon as opposed mm -hmm. to ideas. When mm -hmm. you say um, that w we are commodified and so on, well, that's not entirely true. People do other things other than buy and sell, and, and they, ha they have love lives and spiritual lives. Socially. Literary, literary lives. I mean, you know, it's an economy, yes. And why didn't this movement happen five years ago? Why, why now? Well, I, I think uh, a lot of it obviously has to do with the extreme concentration of, of power and wealth. But the thing about Zuccotti is this is a public space. People, we do not have an area where we can engage each other, where we can uh, engage in dialogue, tell stories. As, as person to person, it usually has to be mediated by some form of currency exchange that we're buying, buying something. And especially in a place like Manhattan, um, uh, downtown Manhattan, much of Manhattan, it's been sanitized. So the important uh, thing for you that it, there's a place to go for like-minded people to talk and to exchange ideas and to pr provide what? A focus for... They want to tell their stories. They want to be heard. I mean, going around the country, people are saying, you know, it's about dignity. Um, they want to be treated like human beings. They, they feel that the American, they, the American dream is a nightmare. Because that... of the failure of what? The system. It doesn't work. I mean, my mother lives in Tennessee, and she has to go through an interview process to get health insurance. She's in her 60s. She's paying over $700 a month out of pocket because she's diabetic. That doesn't work. 
you look at the We Are the 99% Tumblr blog and you have you know, people who are upside down in their houses facing bankruptcy, being kicked out of their homes by banks who are not going to live in those homes. Mm -hmm. It's what? It's an empty piece of real estate now. Do you see the movement as a radical movement or a liberal reformist movement? Uh, the roots of it are, are definitely radical. Like, the thing is when you go around the rest of the country, you're dealing with people where they're at. And, and so as, um, I've been going through the Rust Belt recently, uh, uh, small cities like Allentown, Youngstown, Toledo. Uh, and there are a lot of Obama supporters, a lot of disillusioned Obama supporters, a lot of people who say they are still going to vote for him in 2012. But this economic crisis has been building for 30 years. Did you, did you both vote for Obama, I'm presuming? Uh, the next person I vote for has to believe in dinosaurs. <laughs> if you don't believe in dinosaurs, you should not be elected into office. Okay. You're, you're voting for Rick Perry. No. <laughs> I haven't voted for a Democrat since the caucus. <laughs> okay, who'd you vote for? Uh, I don't know, someone random, probably Nader. <laughs> okay. Um, because I don't think it really matters. Um, it's, it's a dog and pony show. It doesn't matter. I don't think the electoral process really matters, and that's what this is about. I mean, we, we can delve into the background of, of this, but Obama has coddled Wall Street at every single step, and this anger is coming out of a lot of Obama supporters because they voted for this change, and they're getting screwed over, frankly. Jill, Jill, you, you've written both for The New Yorker and then you wrote a book about the Tea Party. One of the... Um, one of the tropes, one of the memes, one of the ideas that's been floating around is how this movement may or may not resemble and how it does or does not resemble the Tea Party as a, either a mirror image or not. So how would you approach this subject? What, what do you, when you in Boston see what's going on in New York and now you've got a, a, a taste of it in Boston as well, what are you seeing historically? What, 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 what has been going on in your mind since September and how does it or doesn't it uh, have any resemblance to the Tea Party? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I can see why people are drawn to the comparison. Just the chronological proximity of these two movements would, would necessitate that we ask ourselves, what, what do they share? And a lot of their rhetoric really does, has, is kind of a matter, anti-matter mm -hmm. <laughs> quality to it. But I think it's too narrow a frame, right? I mean, from the vantage of, of the long centuries of American history, they both share a lot with many other populist movements or movements that claim to be populist. I mean, populism, American historians have written about for a long time as more a theme of American history and a rhetoric of American politics rather than itself a politics, and which is curious about it, because populism doesn't actually have a place left or right. It, it's actually very nimble. It can move across the left and the right, because it purports to be a, a movement of the people against the establishment of the system, the institution, and that has varied what the, what the enemy is of the, of the people has varied over time from the elites in Washington, the liberal intellectuals in the East Coast, the bankers on Wall Street. And that, that, depending on who the enemy is, that kind of casts whether this populist movement is sort of more left or more right. And, and so it's, 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 it's interesting historically to see so, so many of the same inflections that um, you see both the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street using, which is to say, we are arguing on behalf of X, and X over time has changed. F used to be X used to be the plain people. It used to be the common man. Um, it was it was the working people. It was the producing. It was the producing class. It was the laboring class. It was the union people. Um, but then X has also been, you know, for the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan was a populist movement. It, you know, the point of the Ku Klux Klan was to restore to the ordinary American, the everyday American, the Ku Klux Klan used all the language of populism. Um, so the, 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 the interesting thing now is, you know, is the 99% the same as George Wallace's Mr. America, or uh, is there a different set of goals behind this movement? So when, when you think about the big shifts in the 20th century, and I'm going to stop now because I have a problem here. It's like, I tend to lecture. Um, I'm not skipping class. I'm actually giving you my class. <laughs> uh, That's why you're getting credit. Yes, you're getting course credit for this. I will just sum up. That, I mean, the, the basic story of American populism in the 20th century is the early part of the 20th century, it's left, right? Then it moves, to, in the Cold War, it moves to the right. Populism, the, the right becomes very adept at using the language of populism. And when the radical new left in the 1960s 
attacks liberals and destroys a kind of liberal consensus, then there's nothing left on the left, and there's only right-wing populism. So the Tea Party is completely consistent with that and a continuation of that. The question will be about Occupy Wall Street from that long historical vantage. The reason the new left fails and loses ordinary Americans and the workers it's purporting to claim to represent is that it actually has nothing but contempt for ordinary people. John, I want to set out a, a sort of set set of detonations that we can get in, into the um, into the definitely. conversation. <laughs> You've been covering economics all your professional life, yeah. and right now we've seen a lot of signs and arguments that essentially say that Wall Street is, if anything, the enemy yeah. of um, humanity itself. What good is Wall Street? What purpose does Wall Street serve? I'm playing the role of the surrogate banker. Here. I should say, <laughs> I should say, I should say, this is quite important. Um, you will notice the distinct lack of a representative of of Wall Street on this stage, unless you're really broadly defining it. Um, <laughs> we asked six or seven people at banks, hedge funds, and so on. <laughs> Shockingly, um, <laughs> we got no takers. But um, life That's is long. But what, what, Wall Street, <laughs> do you see Wall Street as a complete pox or, or well, no. no? I mean, we've always had a banking system. If we go back to the Roman Empire, there was a banking system. I think what people are reacting against, banking systems are supposed to be supportive of the rest of the economy. They basically exist to take people's savings and to transfer them to people who have investment projects but don't have the money. It's, the technical phrase is intermediation. They're financial intermediaries. What we've seen in recent years, and the uh, subprime crisis, the classic example, is that rather than just doing that job of supporting the rest of the economy, a lot of the bankers and the big banks got so big that they had to sort of take it upon themselves to see themselves as producing wealth themselves, but largely for themselves, rather than just supporting you know, new industries in IPOs, etc. They were trying to make profits to support their enormous shareholder base through trading, through making CDOs, CDSs, all the detritus of the subprime. Uh, collapse. But before subprime came along, they certainly were making plenty of profits for themselves. Why is that in it? But I think it just got a lot bigger. I mean, you know, when Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley were making lots of money in the 80s and 90s, Elliot knows more about this than I do, but they, uh, they weren't a danger to the rest of the economy. They weren't necessarily doing anything much more productive, but they were much, much smaller. I remember when I started reporting on Wall Street in the early 90s, Goldman, for example, Morgan Stanley had, I think, a couple of hundred million in, in capital. Goldman might have had a billion. When the, when the whole, uh, so if they go under, so what? You know, it's tough for them, but nobody else really cares. What you care about in the financial system, why you care if banks collapse, is Goldman, City, Morgan Stanley, they had $2 trillion, Citibank had $4 trillion assets in assets. If that size of an institution collapses, it can collapse the rest of the economy with it. That presents a horrible dilemma, first for Bush and then for Obama. These guys are clearly undeserving in almost all ways but can we just let them collapse? Bush's answer and uh, Hank Paulson's answer was no, we can't. Obama, too big to fail. Too big to fail. Obama's answer was no, we can't as well. I actually think that was probably the right answer to give, but it's produced an enormous populist backlash. People see the banks being bailed out while the mortgage holders aren't, and it's just absolute political poison for Obama. And I see Occupy Wall Street as largely a sort of continuation Sort of, uh, <coughs> oh my god, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'll hold it in next time. <laughs> Jill, was that, was that an expression of disagreement? Or? <laughs> Elliot, what should Obama have done? Faced with this dilemma in the very beginning of his term, exactly as John has described, right. in, in a scenario that not of his creating, of too big to fail, what should he have done? He should have negotiated. The, the, the abject failure of the Obama administration, when they had the banks in the palm of their hands, they could have said to all the bankers when the president invited them down to the cabinet room, instead of saying, as he said, I am all that stands between you and the pitchforks, he should have said, as Roosevelt said, I am holding the pitchfork. And here is what I want you to do. One, reform mortgages, because until we bring the housing market back, our economy will not come back. Two, divest yourselves, go back to a Glass-Steagall world. We separate commercial investment banking, technical stuff that John could explain much better than I. Reform the banking industry. Three, change your pay structure. 
Four, stop lying to your clients. And five, do what bankers are supposed to do. He didn't do any of that because the universe of advisors whom he surrounded himself with, Geithner and Summers, were, as I have always believed, continuity. You can believe it. These were people who came from the same Wall Street-based view of finance. As John said, you need finance to do all sorts of technical stuff. But when finance, which is supposed to be plumbing for the economy, becomes the primary mechanism of creating wealth, you destroy the innermost guts of our economy. That's what happened. He did not stand up to them. And that's why I see Occupy Wall Street as a result, a consequence of the enormous anger. And it's an ugly word, but it's anger that the president, we wanted to reform the system. We don't care if he's partisan, but we wanted him to reform Wall Street. He hasn't done it. How in the world are you going to find a president that's willing to do that when the nature of the political system that we have is so infected by money itself? Like Anybody can answer that. I, I don't think you can, uh, simply put. I mean, I, I think <coughs> that we also need to um, avoid focusing on, on personality-based notions of, of politics because uh, Obama was the number one recipient of money from investment banks, commercial banks, hedge funds, real estate industry, insurance industry. He was always an agent of Wall Street. And, and the thing is, um, if we look back at the historical record, it's very interesting. In September 28th. As, as opposed to who, who's run for president? In it's it's the McCain, nature it? it's it's the nature of this this system. I mean, what I mean, why should we we, we need to wake up and and see what it actually is? We we have the best democracy money can buy. You need you need money to run elections. The unions prov uh, provided about twenty three percent of Obama's money. Uh, Where is he going to get the rest of the money from? It's going to come from the corporations and the wealthy. And so the Democrats are always caught in this bind. They can't outright the Republicans. They can't go to, further to the right. But at the same time, they're never going to be able to satisfy their base because they need the votes from their base. Their base wants um, a social welfare state, largely. But they, they have to run their machine with, with corporate money and with money from the wealthy. Can, can I disagree with you on, on, on a certain point? I think you actually reversed the causation here. President Obama received the money because he was going to win. He didn't win because he received the money. There was a point in time when smart money goes to the winning candidate. It was eminently clear that John McCain could not win the election by the middle of the summer of 08. Is it true that for Jamie Dimon's money is going, for example, has gone gravitated from Obama now to Romney? That's right. I don't, I don't think it's because of an ideological shift. That's, that's right. I mean, Wall Street hedges. It's like buying a credit default swap on the presidential election. Mm -hmm. and, and what they do is bet on who's going to win. So I think the problem wasn't that President Obama was bought intellectually. I think President Obama surrounded himself with people who were very much the status quo. But in answer to your question, David, FDR did it. Teddy Roosevelt did it. There were presidents who came from a certain culture because they understood what was going on in finance and they said, we can't let this survive. President Obama didn't push back hard enough. But in conversations that you, you're having, are the conversations resembling this, or, 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 or is this not the core of the conversation that you're, you're hearing on Zuccotti Park or wherever it is that you are, whether, whether it's in Where Washington occupy. Square or, or in general? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the big conversations that we tend to have at the Occupied Wall Street Journal with the 99% Tumblr blog is how can we communicate this message to people? You know, we're, we're trying to break through this, this ideology that people think that the 1% that they can eventually get there, that the American dream is available to everyone. And the truth of the matter is that you look at, you know, the 400 individuals who hold 40% of the wealth and, you know, 90% of them come from a history of wealth. It's an aristocracy that has continued, it's just the costume is different. Do you think inherited wealth is innately wrong? That's a loaded <laughs> question. <laughs> I, think, I think that it's wrong when you have several generations of a single family that do not have to work and do not have to work for their place in society and are handed everything from the best education to the best job at the end of the day. You have internships, you know, the, you have this internship system 
where you cannot really enter into the real working world unless you serve as an intern. And you do that as an, at an unpaid level. Somebody who is working at you know, a fast food restaurant or waiting tables, that system, they're not allowed to even enter into that system. And then you have other places where you know, the families are paying for the internships, famously mm -hmm. at you know, media companies or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, this is a system that you know, myself, I'm not eligible to have the key to. Mm -hmm. I, it's not available to me. And it's not available to the 99%. And that's why we're here. You know, it, it's, it's a class system. It's a caste system. What, you know, uh, one of the um, big uh, criticisms of the movement is it's class war. It's class war. But you know what? When they cut funding to daycares, mm -hmm. they don't call it class war. They call it, you know, fiscal planning. They just call it class war when we start to fight back. And that's what Occupy Wall Street is. Mm -hmm. Sure. Jill, to this point of class war, this, this is a familiar rhetoric over time, isn't it? And used, uh, uh, in, it's now being used as a weapon against Obama. Every time he dares to speak up a little bit, if not in support, then at least in a kind of tepid commiseration, uh, <laughs> uh, there's, there's talk of class war as if Obama's leaving the West Wing with, as you say, a pitchfork in his hand. Yeah, I mean, I think that's residual of the rise of right-wing populism in the 1960s, early 1970s, and the rise of the new right, where uh, I think the left is still reeling with kind of, tim the kind of uh, an inherited timidity, not an inherited wealth, but an inherited political timidity as a consequence of having, having lost working Americans, um, really, very, very entirely, I think. Um, and, and having been told again and again and again the reason that you have lost that is because, because of the, is one reason is the indulgence in class war. But I mean, again, getting back to this question of money and elections, I'm really struck by how similar all of these complaints, the complaints against bankers, the complaints against political institutions, the complaints against the party system are, and people draw this analogy all the time because it's, of course, where the word populist comes from, it comes from the People's Party of 1890 when the word itself is coined as an adjective by a journalist. But the, the populists in the 19th century were, uh, you know, were concerned about money and elections. Henry George, who's this great popular economic writer in the 19th century, two of his most important essays are money and elections and bribery and elections. He has a very particular legislative agenda, which is to pass ballot reform as a way of addressing some of these issues, to, to pass um, campaign restrictions to address the problem of money and elections. But he also, in addition to having a kind of critique of the class structure and a critique of inherited wealth and a critique of um, the distribution of wealth, has a critique of progress itself in the, the 19th century's entire technological narrative of progress, which is utterly absent, insofar as I can see, from the Occupy Wall Street movement or from the Tea Party, which are very much created by the computer, you know, the digital age's innovation agenda, um, and that embrace innovation as, as a principle. When you could think about so many of the economic problems that have caused a great deal of global uncertainty and the economic crisis itself are not unrelated to the digital age, mm -hmm. right? And nor are the political problems with regard to fragmentation Such and as. partisanship, which are related to the death of the newspaper. I mean, there, there are all kinds of ways in which we might expect a populist movement that was deeply suspicious of innovation as a narrative of our times. And that was very much the case with the populist movement in the 19th century, and that's not the case now, which I'm, I'm I would love to hear from people from Occupy Wall Street about that. Well, I, I think a lot of that anxiety is there, especially in, in the Tea Party movement. There is great anxiety about the browning of America. That That is part of the future. But it shows up in terms of the innovation, in terms of automation accounts for more lost jobs than outsourcing. And and so you do there, – there's this notion that there aren't any more jobs and where these jobs – going to come from. So you do see some of that anxiety in terms of the left and I think where the Occupy Wall Street is coming from culturally, there, there, is, there is this dissatisfaction with the commodified life, with, with modern life. Certainly they use a lot of technology, but they feel it's isolated us. Social media can play a role. Technology can, can Wait, play a so, role. Social media has isolated you and yet it's responsible for... All of this? Argue, ar no. No, no, no. I didn't say that. But as a, as a tool, at the very least. That's what I'm saying. Malcolm Gladwell, my colleague, has never been battered around the head more <laughs> than when he suggested that the most the important thing about Tahrir Square perhaps was not necessarily Facebook. And, and that's true. I mean, I, I would say this is actually the, the first social media fueled revolution. And if you talk to the Egyptians, what they were doing on the ground, it was door to door, 
organizing. It was person to person. It was happening in the cafes, in the, in the workplaces. It, it is a tool, but it's a tool to bring people physically together. And that's why, say, the, the media, publications like The Independent and Occupied Wall Street Journal are important, because it's an intrusion into the physical space. I was talking to a friend whose mother, uh, older mother, was alienated, or she wanted to support the movement, but she felt she couldn't relate to it because it was social media. Mm -hmm. She lives on Union Square. She comes out of the subway. She sees dozens of people reading the Occupied Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that physical connection and that, that kind of that image that made her feel that she could relate to it. And, and why you have these 1,400 movements is because people want to go down there and tell their stories. They want to be connected to other people. The social media can fuel that, and it, it can spur that along, but it can't replace it. Tell me about the 99%, 1% um, phrase. 1% of the 300 million odd people takes in a lot of people. Mm. It's not just the 400 wealthiest people who own the da-da-da-da and all, the rest right, of the, right, we, yes. we know the rest of it. It's an awful lot of people who are, yes, wealthier than the next percent and so on. What does it mean as a phrase, and what does it not mean? Well, uh, where are the 99% Tumblr blog, which I did not start. I merely support the efforts of the man who created it. Um, we've actually been trying to figure out the, uh, you know, the birth of the phrase. And the closest I can come to is there was a, an, an article in Vanity Fair, I think last year, is called Of the 1%, For the 1%, By the 1%. And it just, it, it talks about Ironic. how, yes, <laughs> yeah, okay. yes, um, it, and it talks about how the system as it is in which you have, you know, the stratospheric separation of the classes mm -hmm. is not sustainable for anybody in the equation. Mm -hmm. You know, it does not bring our best and brightest into the positions that they need to be into society. And it doesn't, you know, challenge those at the very top to bring their best to the table. Um, and you know, our everything from our health to our life expectancy is dropping, which I, you know. I mean, this, this, we're basically talking about inequality here. It is fascinating to me why the debate has taken off now, because if you go back and look at the trends, they all started in the 70s. And the person who wrote that article, Joe Stiglitz, I think it is, a uh, Columbia professor, he, lots of other people, Paul Kruger and myself, we were writing about this in the 1990s. Um, exactly the same issues, you know, the top 1% taking an ever larger share of national income, wealth concentration increasing, social mobility declining. Most people think of America as a very socially mobile country, but most studies show it's actually lower social mobility here than in Europe. All those things were all there for the last 20, 25 years. Why did it happen now? I think you've got to go to Wall Street. That's the name of the thing. I think the bailout and the anger of the bailout sort of provided a focal point for all these frustrations that had been out there for years. But it's still, I don't know if that's a 100% explanation, it's still a bit of a puzzle to me why these issues didn't have any traction two years ago, for example, and they do now. I'm curious about the issue of leadership. Um, the, the movement is, is very um, against the notion of leaders and spokespeople and, and, and all the rest. Um, I think I get the general idea, but isn't there also a peril written into that? Isn't there a difficulty written into that? if you want to go further, if, it, if, if it's going to have political impact. And that, you may see, see that as It's up to naive. all of us. I mean, it, it's participation So it's an incubator is, of, of, of discussion and, 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 and... Yes, I mean, we're recreating the town square that we've lost, you know, not in... Outside of New York City, you know, you need to get someplace. You get into a car, you drive to that place, you get out of your car, you hang out in that place, and you get back in your car, and you go home. Mm -hmm. You're not walking with your neighbors in the street. You're not riding the subway with someone who leads such a different life than yourself. Um, it's not in your face. And so these conversations, I, I would love to hear what Arun has seen across the country. These conversations are springing up again, and we're getting to know each other on these completely different levels and having conversations that are conversations, and we're not shouting at each other, as mm -hmm. a lot of mainstream media outlets have presented to us as what political debate is. They have changed that definition, and it's really hurt us as a society, I feel. So. Elliot, imagine yourself a politician witnessing this, listening to this, and you're sitting in an Oval Office or, or a Senate office or wherever it might be. Um, 
you're worried, you're concerned, you're taking advantage of it. How are you seeing at it from a very practical point of view as, a, as an office holder? How much can you afford to ignore it, and at what point can you? Well, well look, if, if you wanted me to play consultant to the president, I would say, <laughs> Mr. President, you had better seize the energy, upset, and anger that goes way beyond those who are actually in Zuccotti Park. This extends... How do you begin to quantify it? How well, would you look, begin to draw the map? Call them data, and I don't necessarily trust it, but if you walk down the street, you talk to people, whether it's cops, delivery men, whomever it may be, I would say 50 to 60 to 70 percent of the American public sympathizes and accepts as a premise the notion that something fundamentally wrong, inequitable has happened. And it goes back to your question of why now. And John is right, the economic trends were evident 15, 20 years ago, but you put those trends together with the subprime crisis, so everybody's home is going down in value. We all know somebody who's unemployed. We have had the individual whom we elected to change this disappoint us. There's now a palpable sense of upset. So politically, what do you do? You have to get in front of it and wave the banner, but you run the risk of looking like an opportunist, right? But I can say this, if the president doesn't somehow and Joe, you had a great phrase before, or somebody did, about his, his sort of very careful meditations on the issue. We don't want meditations. What we want is a bit of emotion, a little passion. So you have to get in front of this and say, yes, I know something unfair is going on. And, and Joe raised, alluded to the issue of globalization, technology. That is the other ingredient that is metastasized here. We are exporting all our jobs overseas. And so people who used to believe that there was a way up no longer believe that. So the president had better get in front of this with a real jobs program, a real program to reform mortgages, a real program to say, I understand Wall Street made out like bandits and we will prosecute them. If he doesn't do that, I think people will say, as we've heard on the stage tonight, he went down as one of us, he came back as one of them. And you don't win that way. He used the phrase at some point, Elliot, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, um, what, fat cat blankers, I think, yeah. once. Right. And ever since, the, the meme is in New York and Wall Street and elsewhere is that somehow Obama is a, a, aggressively anti-business. In the business world, that's the rhetoric you hear. Can I jump in on that? He touched a nerve. And you know what he should have done? Said it again. And again, and again, and again. When you touch a nerve that way, you're, you're seeing the signs of sensitivity. The public responded and said, yes, you're right. He finally gets it. Wall Street has gotten everything they want from this president. Everything. And given nothing back. And so for him to be pushed back so meekly, the one time he says they're fat cats and be scared off, reinforced the notion that he wasn't tough enough to stand up to them. Would it have been a huge difference if Paul Pro <laughs> John or, or anybody, would it have been such a huge difference if Paul Krugman or Joe Stiglitz or John Cassidy had been in, uh, in the chair that Geithner or, or Summers was in? It would have been a terrible disaster if I'd have been in the chair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the others may have been okay. I mean, I don't think so much, I mean, I think Elliot's hitting something here. It's not so much the specific decisions in the bailout that I think would be criticized. This was a Bush bailout, remember, it wasn't even an Obama bailout. Obama just carried on with it, but he's allowed the Republicans to paint him as the bailout man. When, as, as I say, it's a Republican bailout. And I think that's largely because he didn't take a few simple political steps he could have done. For example, you remember the AIG bonuses? Sure. He could have come out and said they should give those back, or at the very least, they should be heavily taxed. Now the Treasury Department was saying we can't do that, there's all legal problems, it sets a terrible precedent. But it's not just AAG, it's Goldman Sachs, all of those, yeah, it's yeah. Citibank. Sure. It's no, I mean, the British is just all make, of them. an example. Yeah. Of one. Yeah. I mean, I think right. there was massive public support for that. And even if you think it wasn't economically that sensible, because it probably wouldn't have raised that much money in the scheme of things, I just think politically it was a no brainer. And, you know, he, he should have done it. I mean, you can't just blame the economic advisors. I'd blame the political advisors there, too, Elliot. I mean, mm -hmm. somebody should have gone into them and said, you've got to get ahead on this. It's going to kill us yep. in 2012. After a couple more rounds of this, or just a few more minutes, we're going to have questions from you. Again, you heard me beg. I won't beg later. Please keep, keep to it. And it'll make for a much more uh, rapid and, and, and uh, efficient dis discussion. Go ahead. So, so I, I, just, I just want to kind of 
push back a little against this. Uh, because, look, who, who was the, the last uh, great liberal president? It was Richard Nixon. You're stealing my line. <laughs> <laughs> That's there's an not, old line. There's not a dinner I go to that is boring that I, I don't decide to say Nixon was the last liberal president. <laughs> Look, I mean, you know... Not that it, this is a boring dinner. I, I, <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we know all the regulatory stuff, you know, OSHA, EPA, clean air, clean water, et cetera. Right. But the guy, he actually pro proposed a national income at one point. He proposed a, a national health care plan right. that was far more progressive than anything even Clinton uh, proposed in, in, in 93. Um, he instituted wage and price controls. And it wasn't because he was a liberal. He was trying to play for the center. So Obama is coming at the end of, you know... You say you want a revolution. Well, I don't know if this is a revolution. You think it's coming at the end of the Reagan revolution? The counter rev We had the counter revolution first. Mm -hmm. And what's important to remember is revolution changes people's consciousness. That's what's fascinating about Occupy Wall Street is it's changing people's sense of self, their role in society, what is democracy. But the Reagan revolution changed our consciousness where we internalize market mechanisms. So students are no longer students. They're clients. You know, Arne Duncan is the CEO of Chicago. Uh, schools, uh, that prisons should be run like businesses, our businesses. So much of our immigration policy is being run by the cost-benefit calculation of the private prison business. Mercenaries run, effectively run a lot of our foreign policy. And you can go through every single aspect of, of our social economic life and see how it's been privatized. And when you get out there and talk to people, they know there's something fundamentally wrong, but they, don't, they can't even articulate it. And they kind of fall back into this um, economic nationalism. We need to bring the jobs back. That's what we're hearing from people. And just like, I'm sorry, that cat is long out of the bag. You're not going to be able to bring the jobs back. Or what happened in 2008, a, a lot of uh, the liberals and progressives romanticized Keynesianism. But Keynesianism was predicated upon having a national capital and, and a strong labor that then the a government could mediate between corporatism, you know, that it would negotiate. There is no national capital anymore. And labor, it's down to less than 7% of the private sector workforce. And so that, that simply wasn't going to happen. So what you get is Obama, who is constantly proposing tax cuts as, as the solution to whatever economic problem there is. And what do you call a president who wait, proposes wait, 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 tax wait, cuts? Wait, wait, a Republican. That's, that's not the <laughs> Arun, that's not the only proposal by the uh, Obama administration the late, the on, latest on the jobs, jobs bill. The, the first stimulus was... All you're hearing was, is jobs, job cuts in that, in that No, no, no. Uh, there, there's bill? a lot of tax cuts in there. It's, it's all uh, about... Uh, tax cuts? I mean... The, the, the no, first stimulus was 40% tax John, cuts. John, go ahead. In my role as the sort of right-wing stooge here, <laughs> <laughs> just defend Obama a bit. I mean, he did run for in the midterms in 2010. He tried to campaign on repealing the Bush tax cuts, if you remember, in August, September, October 2010. And if you talk to the guys in the White House, they just say he didn't get any traction. And it, 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 the polling data supported that. He was out there giving speeches saying, you know, the top 1% have made an X amount of money. We should repeal the Bush tax cuts. The Democrats got slammed in the polls. But he punted in February 2009 when he could have repealed the Bush tax cuts without any problem. He had enormous well, yeah, political he, capital. He could have done that. He hadn't campaigned on repeal immediately. He went into office. And he did. The, he, and it was the middle. I mean, you're going to raise taxes in the, in a dire recession. It's not you know, on Keynesian grounds. That's not a good idea. On on um, the wealthy, it is. Yeah, I, I, that's, I, I don't agree. But he didn't campaign on that, though, did he? Yes, he did. He, well, he, was, he said he was going to do yes, it as he, soon he, as he, he got into he, office. Yes, he said specifically, "I will repeal the Bush tax cut." Look, I, I think this is not the sign. <laughs> no, no, no. Look, I, I don't want to go sign. down that path. I think they made a hundred grievous errors in terms of how they negotiated. I, I do want to defend Keynes a little bit. I think he's actually right. You know, I'm not an economist. I, I played in that, that domain a little bit. Keynes is right, and I, I would uh, defer to John and to Stiglitz and to Paul Krugman. They are confirmed Keynesians, and I think their answers would have changed the economic playing field. And I think the president, if he had actually embraced more fervently that approach to the world, could have done things very differently that would have changed where we are. Look, I I'm, not I'm not disagreeing with Keynes. I'm saying the Keynesian moment has passed. And you, oh, need, look, you I, need to think differently. I mean, Krugman is, is right, and the economists are right. Look, it wasn't the New Deal that pulled the country out of the, out of the Great Depression. It was this little stimulus program called World War II, yeah, but wait a which minute. is can, equivalent can, can of can I, $17 trillion can I, can I stimulus. For one second? But that's Keynesianism. Yes, it may, I agree. Be, it, may, I agree. It, may, it may be an ugly form of Keynesianism, but the war brought us back to full production. And, and I think that, that's a critical point to realize. Um, I want to 
open it up to questions here. Otherwise, we could go on for a very long time. Um, so let's 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 have that awkward moment where somebody asks the first. It's not going to be hard here, is it? <laughs> um, where are the mics? I can't see anything. Are there mics around, or is this going to be a screaming situation? All right, sir, you stand up and promise me a question. I love you. Okay, go ahead. Fire away. And I'll repeat the question for those of you who like me. We could do me. the people's yeah. microphone. <laughs> <laughs> we could. <laughs> Is that the right one? <laughs> Go ahead. No, 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 no. Just do it. Okay, keep, keep it relatively short so we can get a lot of them, but, but do the best you can. Personally, I'm here until... Oh, what, I'm sorry. My, I forgot to do what I said I was going to do. What would you like to see happen? What would come, come out of this? And what would mean success, I think, is really... Um, or, or, or the process of... Process. So I was literally at the ear doctor today. Go ahead. <laughs> My specialty is social media. I am not a policy person. I want to see systemic change. I want to see something that really changes that I can look back in 10 years and say, oh my God, we did that. I and want that, to see. That being what? I don't know what that looks like. It will be anything different than what I'm living in right now. That's what it is. Shouldn't it be a little more specific than that? No. <laughs> There's so much that needs to get fixed. I'll settle for 5%. I mean, seriously. No, seriously, you need to identify it. I think. <laughs> no, seriously. There are a lot of. <laughs> there are a lot of. Very I mean, I think you were doing a better job before of identifying things that you you were right. you were angry about. So, I'm, I mean, politics so can go, go okay, worse so, and better. Okay, so specifically yes. for me personally, not for Occupy Wall Street, the movement, making that sure that's me, Priscilla Graham. I would like to see. Um, corporations be taxed. I would right. like to see a 1% tax on financial... Tax higher than they are now. Very, well, GE was basically paid to have a profitable business in this country. I mean, I pay more on my unemployment check than they do on running a profitable business and, in fact, receive billions of dollars from the government. Okay, so I would like to see uh, corporations being taxed appropriately. I would like to see um, offshore tax havens closed. I would like to see all this money. It's about a trillion dollars. There's a great video um, called We're Not Broke, Just Twisted. It's by inequality.org. And it talks about, about almost a trillion dollars that could be raised in over in a decade. And that money could, spend, could be spent on a, a real health insurance program for everybody in this country to support all educational whatever. And, um, and a federal public transportation system so that people in the middle of the country do not have to be a slave to their car in order to have any kind of lifestyle. Okay. Uh, uh, Arun. Well, I, I think we've already seen something remarkable in terms of this has changed the terms of the debate. Uh, that now no one can deny, not even the Republicans, that there's a problem with the concentration of power, though they may not uh, have a problem with the concentration of wealth. In terms of talking, we, we can talk about policies. Uh, you know, I, I find myself in the uncomfortable position of agreeing with the New York Times that it's not the protesters' job to write legislation. Um, but, but just as the, the Reagan-Thatcher revolution that's called neoliberalism changed people's consciousness, what, what is fundamentally important is changing people's consciousness in terms of, of changing society. And that, and, and that takes a while. You know, I mean, I think, I think that's what we were talking about in, in the mythical I don't inside. Know. I mean, we came from zero to hero with this movement in a month. Right. So That is quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, 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 I think fundamentally we, we can't see our relations uh, as commodities. In, in terms of that, you know, healthcare is, is a commodity right. or access to it, to education. But it goes beyond that. We can't just look at issues of biological reproduction as important they are. Of course, people need housing, they need food, they, they need good education, but we want the good life also, that we want a, a happy, productive life, a happy society. And that's what people are finding through all these occupations 
occupation movements. That's why they've reproduced. Is there, in, in, in my naivete about that argument, is, is there not a, a slight element of we meaning you or the movement or what have you wants what we once used to call European social democratic system at a point when those systems themselves are now in radical change. Some of them moving to the right, some of them becoming xenophobic, some of them collapsing, um, some of them at, the, at, at a minimum deeply, deeply challenged economically. Well, it, it, it's, it's far beyond that because, of course, what was the 60s rebellion about? It was, you know, Marcuse and One Dimensional Man. It's, it's a rebellion against the Soviet system, the banality of the Soviet system and the Western system of the pinnacle of European social democracy where people still don't feel that they had that meaning to where there was still that social alienation. And that's why we have to really pay deep attention to how the system economically produces that alienation. Well, do you want to address yeah, this? Yeah, I can jump in and say, because one of the goals that sort of Priscilla had mentioned earlier, or maybe an even achievement, was returning the town square, rebuilding the town square. And that is something with regard to asking what the Tea Party is all mm -hmm. about. Tea Party people will say the very same thing, feel very passionately about that. What they have reclaimed on the Boston Common holding their rallies is the town square. But at the same time, um, but they at have the same time they're completely different town yeah. squares. And that's yeah. not a town square. Yeah. Um, but that's a that's a political system that's broken. So a goal needs to be faith in our political institutions. And we have now a different different peoples, including you know, the president doesn't have faith in Congress, the Congress doesn't have faith in the presidency. The right doesn't have faith in the left. The left doesn't have to. Have the, no one has faith in the American people. So, for this movement to go anywhere, there needs to be a rhetoric about faith in institutions. Okay. Um, yes, I have a question. Oh, did you want us to line up at the mics? Because I have a question. Honey, here. yeah. All right. But let me let me do the calling on. This, okay. Uh, in the red sweater and glasses or cape or something. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I can't see very well. Uh, Hearing sight. It's all collapsing. <laughs> There you go. Uh, wow, I'm not used to this. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if the panel could speak to the fact, I mean, we've sort of, there's two, two comments, uh, questions, questions. One is around police brutality. OK. So I'll just put that out there. We haven't touched on it. I'd be curious What's to hear. What's the question about it, though? The fact that it, the, or police um, repression of this movement and the extent to which there has been violent repression of a nonviolent movement and what that means. So if we could, we could speak to that, and the fact that it's not a new movement, but a, a, a new space for a movement that has a history in other communities that have been struggling against neoliberalism for a very long time, I think it's, it's, it's reaching now a white middle class, which is why we're seeing a very different expression of this movement. But what would you say the, pre the predecessor movements of? of I think we've seen communities struggling f against neoliberal policies for the last 40 years. Um, and a lot of communities of color, and you know, um, you know, just the, the the extent to which this is hitting a, a, a sort of a new stage. But I think it's a new stage of, a, of an ongoing movement. I, I would just like to hear comments on on the fact that this is a new expression of something that has been bubbling from below for a while. Um, and and if anyone can comment on sure. the police repression, I'd appreciate that. <coughs> I mean. One of the things that was most striking to me after seeing how the NYPD pepper sprayed in the face three helpless women trapped in an orange net was that if you look at the New York City Police Foundation and you look at their donors, and it's Barclays, it's Goldman Sachs, Citibank, it's Chase Manhattan. And it's very interesting that they've been so aggressive towards a movement, a nonviolent movement that is addressing economic injustice that is perpetuated by corporate institutions. Anybody else in that one? Just, John. Uh, I mean, I, I want to preface what I said by saying I think it's a, actually a very good idea that kids are down there and everybody else is down there. I think in reaction to what Jill said, there's been a lack of a populist left-wing movement in this country for 20 or 30 years, and they're clearly touching a chord, which I think is healthy for the political process. I mean, you either believe in democracy or you don't. But I think even if you're skeptical about it, you would agree that it responds to mass movements. And you know, the mass movement has always been on the right. That's why I do see this as a mirror image of the, of the um, Tea Party. Whatever you think of the Tea Party, they shifted the debate to the right in, in a couple of years. And it seems to me Occupy Wall Street has shifted the debate to the left in two months. We're talking about inequality and things now, which 
you know, you just couldn't get a, a hearing for a couple of years. Ago. So having said that, but then on the police, I think the police have done the marches a big favor. I mean, they, uh, they I wrote a blog saying this. I mean, I, I, it's a cynical thing to say, but it turned it from a, a, a small protest movement, the Macy, into a massive international media story overnight. So I think it was, a, it was a terrible blunder on the part of the police and on the part of the NYPD. Right up there, uh, the guy with his hand up in what light color shirt. <laughs> Uh, we'd like to get, a, when do we full, get? Full public financing. Full public financing, a la, what country has that, Rick? Full public financing of elections. Very few. Very few. <laughs> um, well, look, it, it, it would be wonderful. And there are certain states that have had, had clean money uh, bills that have passed. Connecticut has moved in that direction. May and a few states in the Southwest. It works. And it, it does eradicate some of the worst offenses in terms of money flowing to the political process after Citizens United. It's going to be difficult because of the uh, independent expenditure opportunity that I think is a First Amendment issue, if you think about it. You have to be so much sympathetic to. We, we don't like to cobble First Amendment rights. Getting money out of politics, but nonetheless permitting the free flow of ideas is a very tough balance. It would obviously help. But again, I think it is almost superficial to believe if we do that, we will solve the problem. Politics follows the major interest groups, whether or not it is money-driven. They follow the major voices. They follow the major um, sociological movements. And, and I'll disagree with John a little bit about the lack of there being left-wing or, or left-of-center populist movements, the environmental movement, the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the women's rights movements. I think we outnumber the right four to one. Right. Jill is shaking her head. I hate to disagree with the uh, historian <laughs> here. But, but so I don't think we've done that badly in terms of organizing with the more liberal worldview. I think this I think, is a great opportunity. I think opportunity. you're about to get a B minus here. <laughs> well, <that's, laughs> from Joe, I'll take that. Uh, you know, I don't consider most of those populist movements. Populist movements are generally not good at protecting the interests of minorities. That's one of the reasons that liberals have always feared them. They're not good at pluralism. They're, they tend to be nativists. The women's rights movement, civil rights movements are not, I don't, I don't think by, by rigorous definition would qualify as populist movements. I use an unrigorous definition. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have Go a ahead. question then. So, so why wouldn't a women's rights movement be a populist movement if before the women's rights movement, women didn't have the right to have their own money, own their own property, live on their own, be independent of the I think it has men. to do with the definition yeah. of what you're calling populist. Oh, yeah. No, it's a tremendously important movement. It's a movement from the left. It's a movement. It's a rights-based movement. It's all kinds of things. Um, it has a very strong ideology. It has a set of tactics. It does not engage in a, in a, we do not, the women's rights activists did not say, we speak for the American people. They surely could have, um, but they did not. In fact, it's populists who attack the women's rights movements um, in, in the 19th century as much as well as in the 20th century. When we went down to Wall Street, the thing that really struck me was the fact that people were there together helping each other. People were cooking, people were sweeping, people were uh, help getting medical help for someone who just came into this space. Uh, and I feel that what we haven't discussed with all our talk about politics and all of our talk about economics is the moral change that I think is underneath it. Um, I love the quote that was in your newspaper, um, Occupy your heart, not with fear, but with love. This is the newspaper, by the way, that we've been talking about. I mean, I, I actually think that um, in New York City, people are, you know, despite popular opinion, are actually a lot more helpful to their neighbors and people that they interact in public life. And absolutely, that, that's why, speaking to the question about will it ever turn violent, I don't think so, because we've all been so oppressed and so hurt by this system around us. You know, we know how that feels, and it's time to change that, to support each other for the first time and to turn it around and to be a real alternative to the world in which we are living in and struggling against. So, Can I just jump in to say something? That I think, to be fair, because um, although there's no one from Wall Street here, there's no one from the Tea Party either, a lot of Tea Party people that I talk to would say exactly the same thing about what drew them into that movement. I know that's an unpopular statement to make, but people would say, I was alone in my house, upset about the state of the world in my country. 
I went to a bar. I met people who care about this country and who are worried too. And we became, I've made the best friends I've made in my life going to those Tea Party meetings. And until these people talk to those people, we don't actually have compassion. That is compassion in civil society. I, I would actually agree. I've, I've, I've been to Tea Party meetings and I've also been interviewing people. And there are times where I, my head's spinning around because I'm hearing from people in Occupy movements almost the exact same language that I heard from the Tea Party movements about community, about helping each other, about uh, industriousness, uh, self-reliance. The ends are radically different. But there is something there that uh, does really bind a lot of the people together on the, in these two populist movements. I, normally, I would stop it here, but I think we have time for a couple more. Right there, that's you. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the funding of this movement and how, like, the meals are being donated, how that ties into the structure that is. Curious that really about the funding of the movement and how m your meals are coming from, and oh, don't you know George Soros yeah, is paying for all of that. <laughs> <laughs> And the pay sucks. <laughs> um, can you tell us uh, there have been um, there have been enormous wealth of donations that have come in to Occupy Wall Street. Um, for the Occupy Wall Street Journal, we had an initial Kickstarter campaign asking for twelve thousand dollars only, twelve thousand dollars, and wound up uh, with a generosity that came from the public of seventy-five thousand dollars, which is actually really incredible because now. Not only will we be giving money to print the Occupied Wall Street Journal, but like N Plus One just came out with this great, great publication that everybody should get a copy of. And we're going to be um, funding a few more print runs of this because it is so incredible and everybody should be reading it. Um, that was so, called a plug. Yes. <laughs> okay. But um, that Kickstarter campaign was for printed materials for the occupation. It's mostly, it, it's mostly through social media and through donations. Through social media, so everybody giving $5? I mean, that's how it's come in. And there have been um, public What's the money criticism. for? What do we need money for? Well, for this, I mean, we need money for paper, for printing. And what else? Other, other, than, the, other than media? Okay, so other than this media, so then money is also going to be spent on, um, on food for the park. Uh, they, they are looking at office space right now to help with the structure of the movement. Nobody is receiving, and when they talk about expenditures, you know, nobody's receiving a salary. This is all going towards internet server costs, printing costs, food for the occupation, medical supplies. I mean, these are all being spent, and it hasn't been spent out very quickly because in order to have complete transparency on the funding, you need some time and some structures to be put in place so that that will all be taken care of in an honorable way to serve the movement. Okay, well, I think we do have one time for one more question, and you are it. You're uncomfortable about local businesses in the but area, I mean, on, in what sense? It, like there's been reports of uh, local businesses. Oh, sorry. Um, there's been reports of uh, local businesses suffering because of people occupying Zuccotti Park, uh, as you know, in terms of people using the bathroom, people not going to those areas as they would have um, if there weren't people occupying that space. The city should put bathrooms there, porta yeah. potties. Can I just say, we're not going to end on bathrooms. <laughs> we're just not going to do it. We're going to end with you. Nothing about bathrooms, OK? Not that I'm squeamish. But there's been a lot of talk about investment banks, financial institutions, companies or corporations like GE. I think the target is Very good question. In short, are, you, are, are we in danger here of throwing all corp the risk of sounding like Mitt Romney that all corporations are made of human beings? But 
Are we in danger here of throwing all corporations into one well, bucket? I, I and, would... and not just from you guys, but all, all, I, I think we can end with all of us here and, um, and then call it a night, and knowing that there'll be another discussion down the line. In fact, tomorrow morning. Oh. <laughs> Elliot, go ahead. Well, let me take a first shot of this. And I don't want to start listing good, bad, and different. I don't think that's either right, smart, or, or the analytical frame through which to view this issue. I'm going to say something that I said in uh, an interview a few days ago. I'm a capitalist. Capitalism, and we may disagree. I get the sense we do disagree about this. Capitalism creates wealth. I'm a huge fan of those corporations that play by the rules, pay their taxes, hire people, pay a fair wage, provide health insurance, and create wealth. That's what we want. The problem is we have not created a framework for economic activity in this nation right now that properly imposes the burdens and expectations on certain companies to do that. So I'm not going to say Merrill Lynch is bad or good, even though I sued him and did all sorts of stuff for many, many years. Right? <laughs> there are many people there who are doing the right thing. What we've got to do is change the expectations and change the rules by which these major companies play so the capital flows the right way, as John was saying, and we create the jobs. It's not that complicated. I'm a socialist. <laughs> and <laughs> capitalism, capitalism does not create wealth, it steals wealth. It steals wealth from the workers, it steals wealth from communities. It, it destroys, it's destroying our planet, it alienates us. If a capitalist decides that their product uh, is going to make them a profit but it'll poison 40,000 children, well, then that's fine. That cost will be borne by the rest of uh, society. That's what happens every single day in the, in the calculus of capitalism, that people decide for private profit while the rest of the society has to deal with the cost. I would say we need to make public banking, we need to make banking and credit a public good. Just tax them appropriately and pay for things that make my life better, please. <laughs> Fair enough. Jill and John. I'm a Democrat. <laughs> I want the conversation to come out of this to be both about corporations, but to be about the nature of our democracy. And John. Yeah, I, I guess I'm a disillusioned ex-socialist when I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm now a social democrat, um, largely on the grounds, of, the obvious grounds that socialism ran into some local difficulties when it was trying to... <laughs> Unlike capitalism? <laughs> but... I, I think, um, I, you know, I think again, trying to land on an upbeat mode. I think the movement is a positive one because it's bringing these questions to the fore, and it's making life awkward for people like Obama, who a lot of people have a lot of faith in. He's having to answer some tough questions, and I think it, you know it's actually making life a bit tough for the Republicans too. I think it's um, some extreme, some some Republican strategies are trying to turn it into a sort of you know '60s hippie movement. George Willie's saying that. Um, it's going to win the presidency for the next uh, Republican candidate. But the polls don't show that. The polls, as somebody else said, show that actually middle class, average Americans sympathize, if not with the actual um, protesters, with what they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, you know, so far it's a positive movement and it's going to be fascinating to see how it develops. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.